Hey everyone, it's Walker and Nick at Full Spectrum Laser and welcome to Laser Talk. What's up everybody? We've got a great edition of Laser Talk for you this week. Uh, we're going to be talking very specifically about a, uh, something that's very uh, dear to the hearts of a few people that work here at Full Spectrum Laser. One of them is a resident expert on the subject and that is RPG tabletop role-playing games much like Dungeons D and Dragons. You might know it as D&D. &D. It's a cultural <coughs> phenomenal, cultural phenomenon, I think <coughs> is what I meant to say, yeah. uh, that we know nothing about <laughs> at all. We don't know anything. But we do know that you can do incredible things with the lasers that make those type of board games even more fun and even more entertaining. Um, it's actually kind of awesome, all the different applications that the laser has for those type of board to uh, top games. So we're going to go through some of those. Yeah, surprisingly, I, I would have never guessed because that's not my world, you know. But once you're in the realm, per se, ah. then uh, you, you start thinking of all the applications. Absolutely. So uh, what do you say before we get going and we start talking about this, we, uh, we set the mood just a little bit. Okay. You know, like okay. Just a little... Uh, just <laughs> uh, there we go. Okay. We're in a now castle. That we're, we're in a castle now, if you didn't notice. Okay, so now that we're in the castle... Now, when you're playing in a role-playing game, there are many things that you use. The most common thing, though, are these grids that are basically one-inch grids. Uh, this one looks like it is a 8x8. Uh, eight eight. Um, I think they do 10x10 10 10 as well. Uh, and these, uh, so these grids are pieced together, and you basically move around the grid uh, using different uh, items. Now, if you remember from a one-hour build a couple weeks ago, we did have a uh, dice tower that we made. Now, this is a great addition to any type of RPG game with a 20-sided die and a um, you have the 20-sided die. Then you have the um, uh, the other one that's one through ten is called the. Uh, 12 sided. 12 sided. <laughs> so, um, anyway, you, you roll those through here to play the game, uh, uh, what have you. Now, the really interesting thing is uh, with the games, you have different uh, characters like this that take up, you know, like this would be a large character that would take up a uh, 3 by 3. Uh, then they have other smaller characters like this uh, vintage one from the 80s, which apparently is going to get us some street cred. Uh, and that would be a uh, one by one that would move around. Now, what's really cool about that is they have all these different characters, different guys goblins, different ghouls, different guys like that. They're all very, very cool. Uh, so you can actually make uh, your own little guys. Like, So if you wanted to make little goblins like this, here's a good example here of this little guy. I don't know if we can zoom in quite enough. Uh, there we go. But you can make uh, little goblins of your own. Or if you wanted, you could personalize even your own. And I think Walker uh, has something he prepared. <coughs> so this this is my guy. And, uh, wow. Ooh, His oh. name is El Guapo. And El Guapo. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I knew you were going to do that, Walker. So I actually made one that was just a little more to scale. Uh, I don't oh. know if El Guapo is a little... That's a, that seems a little more realistic there. Uh, but if you want, Charles, you can throw up that uh, photo that we, uh, that we took of this. Um, you, it's really great. You can put a, f <laughs> um, a face that looks... Uh, do we have the photo, Charles? You can put it up on the screen for us. Yeah, if you see down, uh, his face looks uh, very realistic. You can put it right down there. We're actually going to do a one-hour build uh, this Friday that shows you how to personalize little characters like this, not just for Dungeons & Dragons, but for any game. Now, speaking of, I, I didn't only make me. I also made you. What it Let's see if we can get it. So there's not only good guys, right? There's bad guys, and there's disgusting-looking monsters. So I made a Nick. Uh, mm. I think the resemblance is uncanny. <laughs> like, That's my pretty goodness. good. Um, it's funny you mentioned that because I actually knew that you had some. I saw you on the laser doing something that you didn't want me to see. So we actually made a walker that's very to life. This is. Oh, that's the world star. <laughs> that's the most accurate walk. I mean. If you've ever seen Walker at the beach, it's very. Oh, this is very close. <coughs> that is a low very, blow. very, very, I very need close. To step up my game. Um, That's bad. <laughs> um, but like <coughs> you said, you can make these uh, personalized characters and uh, different things uh, this is mine for now. the board. Now, now it's not just characters. If we want, we can uh, tilt down just a touch here so we can see some of our things. Now, on this uh, this board, uh, there's other things that uh, you can do now. There's uh, indications like this. You can make little fire squares where uh, this square would be on fire. There's larger things like this where this is ice or um, uh, frozen. So people can be uh, inside. Oh, where's your uh, El Guapo? So you can put El Guapo in here and he would be frozen or, uh, you know, on ice, uh, what have you now. 
the probably more interesting thing is all these personalized tokens uh, like this. Now, these little personalized tokens are like stunned. Yeah, let me get a little backdrop there so it focuses. There we go. So maybe that focuses. <laughs> Almost. Well, anyway, yeah, these uh, little tokens are all personalized things such as, you know, dying, prone position, um, unconscious, Poison. stunned, poisoned. All those little things you can also personalize and make your own. Even neat little things like pirate ships to add to the experience. Yeah, that's, um, that's cool. Things like that. Now, even simple things like uh, setting out boundaries uh, with these neat little acrylic corners uh, can be done. So. If you are a Dungeon and Dragon enthusiast, um, or maybe you're a laser owner and want to get into Dungeons and Dragons, you can easily add to the experience and really personalize your game in a really cool way. You know, make your own board game, really. Absolutely. So, From let's say scratch. Dungeons and Dragons was something that you were really interested in, but you wanted to, you know, do something that was your own or something that was just yeah. uh, had like your own twist to it. Well, very easily you could take your idea and formulate the entire concept using just the laser. Yeah, uh, and then you can mass produce tons of ugly nicks for your. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, tons of ugly nicks or <laughs> tons of anatomically <coughs> correct walkers. Well, either way, lobby walkers. Um, yeah. Very anatomically correct. Uh, either way, so as we're moving on, we have uh, actually a resident expert that we want to have on. Um, He's known around the, the layers and the dungeons as the, uh, the <laughs> big dungeon D. He's, uh, he used to battle as with nail. He is the, uh, the, the chosen the of the daddy. dungeon master himself. <laughs> uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Scott Lipsy, everybody. If you're a rock out, yeah. Just scooch over give make a little room. Here we go. All oh. right. Hello, everybody. Here I am. Welcome, Scott. So we're going to share um, a microphone a little bit like right. we did back then. I think I have my microphone stand here so we can go, go a little, little bit. Little Bob Barker. Go a little Bob Barker <laughs> here on this. Um, that's probably really annoying to listen to. Sorry. <laughs> We'll just do it like this. Um, okay, so Scott, again, thanks for taking a moment out of your schedule to come visit us today um, on our very special Dungeons and Dragons editions. And waiting for this episode. This is uh, <laughs> since I mean, he started. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, Scott is our resident expert of uh, Dungeons and Dragons and all things uh, of the ilk. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you see uh, professional? Uh, excuse me. How you see uh, a business focused around uh, using lasers sure. and these type of games? So uh, probably the most common business that people who play the game uh, have experience with is your local game shop. And so you'll see local game shops selling these things from third parties. Uh, and more than this, like card boxes and stuff like that, that you can tell are already laser cut. I mean, they, they come together for the uh, collectible card games and stuff. I've seen in the stores the, uh, the conditional markers and stuff like that. So what a laser, uh, or, I mean, a, what a, a game store owner could do is cut out the middleman, buy himself a laser cutter, and start manufacturing these things himself. So for instance, how much would you charge for one of these conditional markers that you would buy? I'm guessing this is something you'd pick up at the register, you'd see Yeah, uh, like, a, like an impulse item and stuff. Absolutely. Now you could package those as a set with every, you know, one of everything. You could throw it into a bin and have them sell for 25 cents, or you could put custom faces on them so that you know, your customers say, I want my own customized tokens for my character, and those you could sell for you know a dollar a piece or a set for five dollars. I mean these things are are pretty well priced in stores already. They they mm -hmm. because they're popular. And just to talk a little bit on that margin, if uh, you were selling a set of these for five dollars, the overhead on cost of goods on this would be somewhere around five cents. Um, I would say maybe as far north as a quarter. If I had to really gamble, I might say fifty cents, but it would be very hard to. It'd be yeah. very hard to convince me that it was 50 cents the cost of goods. And the t amount of time it takes to run off a set of these, I think Walker ran this off total job in about 20 minutes. So there's really yeah. not a lot to it. Uh, what other ways right. do you think they could do uh, using it? The, the tokens are the same thing, the character tokens that you have. I mean, you could put uh, 100 goblins on one, one board and uh, one piece of material, and then you've got an army. That stuff costs a lot more. Like to get an army of 100 goblins, you know, you, you, first of all, they don't sell just packages of goblins. You, you generally had to buy randomized packages and pull all the goblins out. So you could customize the leaders, the generals of the goblins, or all that stuff. You could have 100 mm -hmm. goblins printed up. People come in and say, I need, I need a goblin army. Boom, an hour later, you're selling them a goblin that's, army, a custom goblin that's army. That's really cool. So they don't really have a group like that. 
if you right. need something. I, I haven't seen them in the stores. Yeah. So really, the um, on Friday when Walker walks through how to personalize your own lifelike, anatomically correct characters, um, what you'll be able to do uh, feasibly is add a skill set to your uh, store where uh, you could charge someone for coming in and personalizing either as a gift or as a personalized thing. Uh, what would someone maybe charge for a personalized game Ooh. token look just like them? What would uh, I mean, a ticket item... like that? I mean... Ten dollars if it's got a custom face on it, a custom mm -hmm. pose, custom armor, you know, like... They've got, I'd, need, I'd have to have a bow and a long sword and a feather in my hat. I mean, you can do that now. Uh, and so just, uh, already people sell just portraits of people's characters. This is just the next step of saying, well, you don't want just a portrait. You want, you want a token for the game. Yeah. You know? So you can, so that's one area. There's another area where, where this could be used. Um, you mentioned at the top of the show the rise of popularity in the game. And that's largely from uh, semi, semi celebrity DMs pip popping up on Twitch. Um, like, um, Matt Mercer is someone that it's well known out there. A lot of celebrities are playing in these games. So if you're interested in having your own Twitch show, you could use the laser cut to start branding your items. You're going to have a, a like a, a dice tower that's going to have go. your custom sort of logo, you know, so that when people come on the show, they see that the items on your show are custom to your world, to your thing and stuff. So that's a way of branding yourself and becoming more known and popular within the uh, within the industry, within the uh, the Twitch streaming industry. So the way to skyrocket your uh, your presence and stuff. You also mentioned about making uh, your own boards on uh, your own personal games. In what ways uh, could you see people making their own actual boards? Like these are just basically uh, one inch by one inch grids, correct? Right. So you could do. Uh, hallways. You could cut a uh, two two block by ten and have a, a ten foot you know a long hallway that's ten feet wide. You oh. could create uh, different oh. shapes of rooms, round rooms. You can engrave the, uh, the 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 flooring so you could have a church with pews and things like that and so lights. Walk over the pews and stuff. Right, right. So ideally, um, if you were something, I mean. I'm guessing a little bit here. When you set up a D&D game, you'd have a board set up that would basically be a rectangle. You're saying at home you could set up on your tabletop or kitchen table a personalized board that could have multiple different little things that could connect almost like a hamster uh, maze. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly what could it is. Could levels as well? Yeah. I mean, you could even put, you could build little stands so that you could have your things. Act I haven't cool. seen that done yet. That'd there, be really is cool. there not yet a double-decker RP? This might be our challenge. This might be That's our challenge. That cool. might be our next big build is a double-decker RPG board game. We'll see. Well, I saw your ship that you guys did. That was incredible. That's like the, m the most amazing 3D thing. That would make people go mad. You know, it's like a oh, yeah, what Scott, if you turn that into a board? Yeah, so Scott yeah. was mentioning that turning in large projects into that uh, and then making them into RPG games uh, not yeah. only is something you can have as an art piece or a piece of uh, decor. Oh, right? yeah, double. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. So I've got one other thing to suggest. Um, there's another aspect of role-playing games, which is LARPings, which is live-action oh, role-playing games, yeah. which is another side of cosplay, but it has a lot more props in it that you actually use to play and stuff. And, uh, and so you could make leather uh, sword cases, scroll cases. Uh, you could engrave wands, right? We have the uh, rotary that you yeah. could do. So you could put wands in there and engrave customized textures to, to wands That'd and things cool. like that. I mean, that stuff, talk about a profit margin, you know, people are crazy for customized stuff like that, and where else can they get it? Yeah. And so, um, you know, there's just a whole another layer of things you can do with uh, live, live action props. Yeah. Now, do you LARP? No, I don't. Uh, I, I have not I LARPed. Would, I would pay to watch. <laughs> do, they, do they have things like this when they have live action role playing or anything like that? Okay, tokens? right. So you might have seen the famous YouTube video where the guy's like, lightning bolt, lightning bolt, lightning bolt. Yeah. So you can make a little bag. And you could put a bunch of acrylic lightning bolts in there, and now he's got his, he can actually throw lightning bolts out. Man, that's <laughs> on another level. <laughs> it is. That is, that is on a whole other level. <laughs> um, I'm not even sure how to respond, but it sounds, I sounds pretty cool. Myself, but, um, uh, I want to try. I would try it. Um, I've seen that uh, movie uh, Role Model. Yeah, yeah that's that they're LARPing in that. They one. are LARPing. Okay. They are LARPing. They're yeah, they're butts up. I have nunchucks. They look pretty fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, LARPers are fun people. If it meant I could get a big foam sword and whack Walker all afternoon, that oh. sounds pretty fun to me. Yeah. Especially if you know he's going to be dressed as he would well, in that, his normal attire, yeah. which is pretty accurate to life how I he looks. Pretty much on a Sunday. 
Um, yeah, I mean, most Saturday afternoons, that's well, how you find Walker. I'll give a shout out to the Society of Creative Anachronisms too, which are like LARPers, but they actually fight. They actually oh, have rattan cool. swords and fight. They're always engraving leather armor, their swords. You know, again, a laser cutter, which would be something just would wake, you know, open their world up to so many different possibilities. I saw someone doing chain mail with the laser cutter, which oh, really? was incredible. It's really, really incredible. Hmm. Um, the, uh, there's actually a cosplayer who uses our, um, uh, our laser to make some of the wraps. I'm not sure what that's called when it goes over your shoulder and it stacks. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Those are sweet. Those are very, very effective. They look so great and they give such a good dynamic to a uh, costume, whether it's for oh. LARPing or cosplay. They, they look incredible. Yeah, you can make the whole gauntlet. Oh, absolutely. Like all kinds of stuff. Absolutely. Um, even some of the things you do um, around the optics that go around the, the eyes or the top of the oh, head, yeah. um, things that kind of overset. I think you have, uh, what's the uh, character that you've got the headset for? Oh, that was Dragon Ball Z. Though. It's a Dragon Ball, but still, it's uh, very similar. It's for a costume. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very similar. All right, well, um, I think there was one more thing we wanted to talk about real quick uh, with you, Scott, and that was an incident that happened in the 1987 D&D Championships in Fresno, California. Anything to say for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> we're back. Hey, we're back. So sorry about that. A little bit of technical difficulties. There was actually a Zeppelin balloon that ran into our building and exploded on impact. So we apologize for that. Quick Everyone's cleanup. okay. Quick cleanup. Uh, really easy. All Everyone survived, so nothing to worry about. Uh, Scott, though, was just going to give a little uh, mention, shout out to all the people uh, he beat and defeated in the 1987 World Championships at the D&D <laughs> Finals in Fresno, California. So, Well, that's the thing about D&D. There's no winners or losers. It's, a, it's a, not a competitive game. It's a cooperative game with your friends and stuff. So Absolutely. That's probably the best part about it. It's yeah. um, it, what it seems like. And again, uh, we might have to have our first D&D experience all together as a work learning experience after we uh, create personalized characters for ourselves on Friday. But uh, that what seems to be the best part is everyone gets together and there's not necessarily one person playing against anyone else right. it's one person having experience that's cooperative with everyone else it's almost like life that's it yeah it's, it's pretty great yeah stories yeah stories. there you go collective storytelling yeah so if your kids into dungeons and dragons or any other any, role playing any other game by all means encourage it it's uh builds a lot of good interpersonal communication skills mm -hmm. uh really 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 sparks the uh, imagination and allows you to create a world all of your own so maybe you're not a storyteller in a traditional way maybe you don't write maybe you don't uh, make movies maybe you don't take photos uh, this type of uh, interaction is actually a way for you to really express yourself and uh, tell stories in a way that's a little uh, non-traditional teach your kids yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's versions for, for young children, too. Absolutely. Well, Scott, thanks so much for stopping right. by, man. Thanks. We'll see you Logger. again. We'll see you see around you, the hallway. Thanks again. Cheers. Right after the show, I'll see you. <laughs> we'll see you in 10 minutes in our office. <laughs> okay, let's stick that bad boy back on. All right, so what do we have next going on, Walker? So we're going to run through for the laser people. Everyone's a laser test. people. So we have a material test that's uh, located uh, on our website if you haven't used it before. It's uh, really useful. Uh, it looks kind of as you see down below. Um, and what we're basically going to do right here is uh, we're going to run you through the material test in real time, exactly how you use it. Um, some people have wondered, you know, okay, well I have this little one inch by one inch square. How do I actually use this material test? Well, here we go. We'll walk you through it step by step. Now. Basically, the first thing you want to do, and we'll pull up the uh, software here, or sorry, the uh, screenshot. Oh, excuse me. Okay, so you go to our website here. Um, now, the web address up there is basically laser101.fslaser.com backslash material test. If you just go to our laser101 homepage, you'll see it on the bottom. Can't miss it. So, once you get to the page there, you go down to the download files, and what you'll see is uh, six, or sorry, five files there. Um, the one all the way to the left is the material test file that you need to have. That's what you'll download. Um, the other ones are an AI file if you wanted to download it and have it in uh, Illustrator. The PDF, though, is editable, though, inside of Inkscape if you wanted to open it up in there. There's also two material test log sheets that are right there. One of them's printable, and the other one you can actually download and use inside of Excel if you wanted to keep track of it on your computer. Uh, and then the other file is just a zip file that has all of those things contained in one if you wanted to just download uh, one all at once. So once you have uh, it downloaded, you just want to drag and drop that into your Retina Engrave software. Now, 
as you can see, we have it uh, drug in here, right here. Uh, we have a piece of uh, Kona wood inside uh, the Muse Hobby Laser here that is actually a piece of wood that the uh, Fender uh, uh, Research and Development Team uses uh, as they are developing new guitars. Uh, Fender actually just picked up uh, one of our Pro 36 machines as well as one of our fiber lasers uh, for the Research and Development Team as they uh, develop new guitars. Uh, so this Kona wood that uh, we're going to do a material test right here, uh, we're just going to put that one inch by one inch square up towards the top. And as you can see, it has a solid fill in the middle and then uh, six different uh, vector color lines. Now what we're going to do is uh, basically run this test three different times because this one square allows you to run a material test three different ways. So the first way we're going to do it is as a solid fill engraving. Now, over uh, what we're going to first do is just on the material test side, we're going to um, on RE2 hit the uh, eyeball sign uh, for the vectorization so that we don't run the uh, vectors on this uh, job. So we're just going to hide the vector uh, line. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, now, the engrave section here, uh, we can have two sections. Now, if on the engrave section, if we hit half tone dither, uh, what we can do is you'll see that that uh, middle section is actually, we hit half tone dither, please. Thank you, sir. It's half tone. Is it dithered out? Yep. Oh, there we go. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong, uh, the wrong monitor. So uh, with the half tone dither there, uh, you can see that it actually is a perfect gradient from uh, black in the middle to white all the way on the edge. Uh, there's an example of it there in the bottom left hand corner of the screen. Um, now. That's at 250 dpi, you see there, uh, that um, gradient uh, dot pattern will actually change and be less noticeable as your uh, dpi goes up. Uh, it's just uh, more noticeable there so you could see in this example. Now, uh, we're gonna go back to uh, a solid fill though in RE2, which all you have to do is click the button right above it uh, and it takes it back to a solid fill. Now, if you go over to the black and white uh, threshold, um, basically, as you slide the black and white threshold left and right, you'll see uh, more and less of that circle appear. So basically what we're going to do is just adjust that circle so it is um, you know, encompassing all the way outside of that last um, circle but not quite making it, there you go. So it's just one complete circle. So now our power and speed settings at 250 dpi, we're just going to go with um, basically 50% power and 50% speed. Okay, so then once we have that set, um, if we want, we can uh, swing over to the uh, camera in the Muse, and we'll see we have it lined up right there in the middle. Uh, this on our 40 watt unit there. We're just gonna run the perimeter real quick to double check our location, and uh, then we'll just run this perimeter real quick and kind of see uh, what we have. So with the material test, it's important to keep track of the settings that you used as the job is running. Um, this is basically going to give you a basis to go from uh, once you have a look at how the, the, uh, the test has come out. So as you can see, it just being a one inch by one inch square, you can actually make this bigger or smaller in RE2 or RE3 just by clicking the corner and dragging it larger and smaller. We have it arbitrarily at a one inch uh, square just so it's easy to plan for. Now as you can see at 50% power and 50% speed, uh, the engraving is pretty good. It's a pretty good mark there. Um, Pretty, um, pretty deep. Uh, the Kona wood isn't uh, super hard, but it is rather dense, even though it's a, a bit soft. If you've never worked with Kona wood before, it's a great wood for not only engraving, but also for uh, cutting and marking. It just cuts super clean, uh, fits together well. Now, um, Ruben, if you would just kind of tilt the uh, wood up a little bit closer to the camera. Um, as you, uh, you might want to push the uh, laser head a little bit out of the way before you do. Um, but we'll just tilt that up near the camera that's inside the muse so that we can get a good look at the wood. You might have to take it out from underneath the, uh, uh, there you go. Mm. Now as you can see, that's a pretty good mark. Um, I don't want to say there's anything to complain about, but a nice clean uh, mark. Uh, yeah, there you go, Ruben, that's good. Um, uh, about, it looks about a millimeter and a half, maybe two millimeters deep. Uh, real nice. So if you would put that right back in, Ruben. Now, let's say the goal here was though, um, you want to have a nice deep dark engraving. Now, how would we make this engraving darker, Walker? <clears throat> More power. 
more power. So uh, what we were going to do is we're going to put the laser back over top and then uh, Ruben's actually going to initiate the camera sequence right there from the Muse Hobby Laser. Uh, if you don't do this yourself, uh, it's really easy to initiate the camera sequence by pressing the camera button once on the Muse and then pressing it just a second time once it turns white and that'll start the camera sequence. Uh, this is great because it'll run the camera sequence in the background and you can continue using RE2 or RE3 while the uh, camera is uh, doing its work on the Muse. So once we have a good picture of the laser bed again, we're just going to position the uh, material test a little bit below that. If you want to bring the camera back over the software, Charles, thank you, sir. Uh, now we're just going to take that um, material test and we're going to move it down a little bit below uh, and run it one more time really quickly um, at uh, a different power and speed setting and just show sort of a difference on what you can do. Now, obviously at 50 power, 50 speed, that can get um, a little bit darker. Now. If we increase the power and keep the speed the same, it will basically uh, make it, it should make it darker than that uh, with a very similar um, output as far as uh, time is concerned. So we're going to put it power what? We're just going to, uh, so we'll keep the power, oh sorry, we'll move the power to 100 and then we'll keep the power or the uh, speed at 50. Alrighty. Kristen Sandbauer Bodmer, thanks for tuning in and watching. Do we have any other viewers that we can give a shout out to? <coughs> Jason. Jason was watching, yeah? Hey, Jason, how's it going, sir? Uh, we do have we a quick question from Alec in Fresno, it looks like. Sorry for missing that, Alec. Uh, it says, help, my Muse camera isn't working. All I get is a black screen. Luckily for you, sir, that is an easy fix. Chances are it's just your lens cap is on your camera. Don't worry, it happens to the best of us, happens to me. Uh, just check the lens cap on the camera. Uh, chances are you just got to pull that off. Uh, it's a good thing to replace uh, on the Muse at all times. That way as you're running, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, smoke and debris that comes off of an engraving uh, as you're running your Muse. So it's always a good thing just to keep the uh, camera cap on anyway. But if you're getting black screens uh, when running the camera sequence, uh, chances are it's just that. Uh, oh, sorry, one more. Uh, Jake in San Diego asks, uh, will we be at Maker Fair Bay Area in May? We absolutely will be at Bay Area uh, Maker Fair in May. Uh, come check us out in our normal location. Uh, we'll give you more details on that in the next couple weeks as it comes up, but we'll absolutely be there. Uh, Dremel will actually be there as well, uh, revealing their version of the Muse, the uh, Dremel DigiLab uh, laser cutter. Um, that'll be its first full uh, in the public demo. They released it last year at World Maker Fair, and this will be the first public display where they'll be doing demos as well. So come check out the Muse. Uh, we'll have uh, RE3 on Pro uh, demos uh, on software <coughs> display there to check out as well. So Maker Fair in San Diego, oh sorry, in Bay Area, definitely worth checking out this year. All right, Ruben, thanks so much for manning at the Muse there again. Now, as you can see, um, very plainly, even from this distance, you can see it's much, much deeper um, uh, than the one above. So with this material test, uh, that's really the ideal way to run it. Uh, you give one test, uh, kind of see where it ends up, and then uh, see what you get with the second one. Now, you'll see some lines in there, and that's really just from the grain of the wood. If we twisted the wood a different way, you would still see the, the lines in the wood that same direction, as it's just the grain. Uh, and as the wood grows, uh, that's actually, you're seeing the growth pattern there. Um, each year as it grows, there's a, a section of the wood that grows, it's a little bit more dense. That's uh, the dark part of the edge there. And then mm. the lighter section is the, uh, the kind of the growth spurt that happens during the growing part of the season. And it's important to notice that this is a solid piece of wood. Absolutely. So this isn't a, um, a, uh, a ply. Yeah, so you're going to see those grains a lot more. Absolutely. So if we would now, um, Ruben, if you'll switch that piece of wood with the uh, birch uh, that we have right here. Uh, Walker, I'll hand it up. Uh, this is actually, uh, yeah, go the other side up. Yeah, that side down. There you go. Yeah, that up. Yep. So this is a, uh, a pretty standard birch veneer. This is a little bit nicer quality than you would get uh, at uh, you know the standard store. This is on par with a Romark quality of uh, materials, uh, which remember if you are a FSL customer, hop on to Johnson Plastics Plus and pick up some Romark materials. They just sent us a Christmas load of uh, materials to make some projects on. Uh, we got it in today. Uh, big shout out to Romark uh, and Johnson Plastics Plus. Uh, every Muse and Hobby Series gets a maker pack with it. Um, Use that 10% off discount, it, it goes a long way. The prices on their products are essentially the exact same as they are. If you went to, uh, you know, Joann's or uh, where else would you go? Uh, Michael's, Michael's or something uh, like that. 
Uh, you're paying about you know five bucks a sheet uh, for a foot by two foot sheeting material, but they also have the larger sheets. So if you're a pro user, man, I'll tell you, we just got a bunch of, what are those two foot by four foot sheets? They're huge. They're huge, they're so big. They're bigger than the table we're sitting at. Uh, and they are amazing on the pro uh, 36 and 48. Uh, even if you have a pro 24, they uh, fit through the pass through doors. Uh, it's just the, to us, it's the only way to get materials by big sheets. Yeah. It's way better. Okay, so now that we got the other piece of material in there, we're just gonna show you uh, the dither function and sort of how to dial that in. And when you're doing a dither, um, chances are you're gonna be doing it with a photo or you're gonna be doing it to show contrast and some other sort of design. So what we're gonna attempt to do here with this dither is just give a nice even marking uh, on the dither as to show a full scale gradient across. Now, the third way you can use this, we'll show you next, and that's just to use the vector marking so you can kind of figure out which vector um, power and speed settings you can use for either vector marking or vector cutting on your material. Uh, so rather than running your job four times to figure out what's the proper speed and settings, you can start with our suggested settings and then use the other lines to kind of dial in from there uh, what your speed and settings should be at. So as you can see, the object there is, uh, we just positioned it over top of the birch in the software. Now we're gonna hit the half tone dither button again, and you'll see that's gonna take the solid circle back to the gradient. And again, that's a perfect gradient uh, created in a design software where the center portion is a 255 black and the outer corners are a 000 white. So a perfect gradient from center to edge. This will allow you to sort of see the dynamic contrast uh, across the board. Now. Uh, what you'll notice is some of those lines that go across uh, the uh, vector lines you can see and some of them you can't. Now, the only one you shouldn't be able to see very well is the yellow one. The other blues, cyans, uh, pinks, and uh, blues will pick up with the dither because those fall into the grayscale when you hit the dither mark. So a good way to tell which, uh, the reason those colored lines are used on the material test is so that you can tell what vector lines are gonna be picked up when you do a halftone dither on your project. So now that we have that set, we're gonna go ahead and go over to the settings. Now there's uh, three settings on dither that you also wanna keep in mind uh, that are not just power and speed. Uh, if you could click on uh, the layer there, and that is down below, um, which is the blur filter radius, the edge enhanced uh, threshold, and the intensity correction. Now real quick, just to run through those to show you what they do. The blur filter radius is essentially um, going to help f the, um, the software figure out how much of the blur that's naturally put into autofocus things, how big the radius of those pixels are gonna be. So if you push that slider all the way to the right, you're gonna have a lot larger pixels in your blurred areas. Uh, this is good for uh, stylized things, but typically you wanna keep that setting right where it's at. Now the edge enhanced threshold is one that you may use much more, and that basically, it picks up the edges. So if you can see along the edge of my shoulder, it would notice that edge of my arm and the background behind it, and it would give a little bit of enhancement on that line. So if you maybe have a group shot or some things that are a little bunny, play around with the edge enhancement threshold to have a few things come out that might not otherwise do so. And then the bottom one is the intensity correction, which basically is, for lack of better terms, a, a brightness control. That intensity basically just helps with a little bit of the luminance of the, uh, of the image. And if something's coming out a little bit dark when you're engraving it, try giving it just a little bit of a nudge on the intensity correction and seeing if that helps. Same thing if, the, uh, if it's coming out a little bit light. Uh, same thing with the intensity correction, just bring that down a little bit. Now, uh, as you can see there as well, the material test also has those vectors. We'll do that on the next run though. So we're gonna run this uh, material test uh, with raster and power speeds of 50 and 50 again at 250 DPI. Now, in this case, we're probably gonna go with a, small, a lower power. You can go ahead and run the job. Um, appreciate you, Walker. Uh, so we're gonna get this job running, but what we're gonna notice as this job runs is we're gonna actually probably dial back um, the power on this one as to just give enough of an engraving to uh, show a real nice uh, gradient. Now, when you're doing photo engravings, that's really what you're trying to do. You don't want to overpower a photo engraving. You don't want to give too much speed. You certainly don't want too much power. And uh, you certainly don't want anything to be too densely uh, located with, um, with pixels. So if you have a very busy photo, we don't really suggest you ever use 1000 DPI for photo engravings, but a very busy photo, you almost want to do a lower DPI on just so you can pick up a little bit more of what's going on. Uh, yeah. When engraving on tile, you almost always want to use a lower DPI as you're, you know, um, you don't get a lot of uh, difference uh, as you're going across tile. Uh, what's another example of using a lower DPI is better? 
Mm, I would say j- solid wood is a good one. Absolutely. It will give you a better contrast. Yeah. Um, with the 250 DPI, there's almost a suggestion that it's uh, a bit like a uh, cartoony. You know, almost yeah. gives it a little bit of a... And that's actually kind of the science behind it, where the dot density is a lot like uh, you know, newspaper density. Uh, so, Ruben, if you want to pull that out and just uh, kind of twist it around, so you can probably hold it in there upside down if you wanted. It's a little bright. Here, why don't you hand it to me? We can probably get a little bit better exposure on this camera. It's probably just a little bright. Let's put us on the big screen real quick, Charles. So as you can see, um, there we go. That was a pretty good engraving, but um, that was actually just a little dark. Uh, we don't have a real good contrast in the gradient. So what we're going to do is we're going to stick that back in there. You can definitely see the difference, though, between solid and... Oh, absolutely. Good. There's uh, there's no question the difference. But now on this uh, run, we're basically just going to run this job uh, with a little bit less power um, and keep the speed up. Uh, so we're going to take the raster speed and, ta- and take it to uh, 75 and take the raster power down to 25. Now, by speeding up the laser head and by giving it less power, we're not only allowing the laser to affect the material less because it has uh, less power, but it's also affecting the material less because it's spending less time in any one position. So as you increase speed, you decrease the effectiveness of the laser as far as power is concerned. So it's still effectively uh, to use, it's still as accurate, um, but if you were trying to maximize or trying to, um, I would say, get the most efficiency from it, you have to remember that um, laser head speed is essential as you're um, going through and dialing it in. Uh, Tiffany Brown uh, comes in on Facebook and asks, uh, I've been using 1 8 uh, laser grade uh, birch ply ever since I received my Muse a few months ago. All of a sudden, I'm not getting a clean cuts all the way through. Is there something I can do to improve this? <clears throat> Tiffany, great question. I appreciate you asking. So uh, there's a couple things you can check. Uh, The first thing I would check is my alignment. Uh, That would be the very first thing, but even before I align the laser, I would Mm. probably clean my optics. Yeah, I would definitely check the optics and uh, make sure that there's no hazing or anything of that sort. Clean it it with your lens wipe, and then uh, if that still continues, then go ahead and walk through alignment. Absolutely. Uh, Many times at home, uh, I'll notice that the last few... Uh, items don't cut out on a run, and I wonder why, you know, the power settings work for the last, you know, four hours. Why is it off now? Mm-hmm. And really, it's just because a little buildup has come up on the lens, and the laser beam just wasn't passing through the lens very well. I, you know, you give every mirror and the, the lens a quick wipe, and you're back to good to go. It could be as simple as that. It could yeah. require just a quick alignment, though, which yeah. really, um, if you're already not close, it's five or ten minutes. It's, it's not like you're aligning a laser from inception or, like, aligning some of our old yeah. pro lasers. Yeah. And, I mean, you've got to think that anything on those lenses and mirrors is going to diffuse the laser a little bit. So it's going to throw it off just a bit. So anything on there, just clean it off. Absolutely. But great question, Tiffany. We appreciate you uh, you writing in with that. And uh, there's also a video um, which Ruben's going to grab the um, alignment uh, video for you. And he's going to uh, put that uh, link down below in the comment uh, on Facebook, on YouTube. Just check out our page uh, and it'll be... Uh, Probably one of the suggested videos at the end of this uh, uh, clip. So uh, back to the uh, software over in the um, thing. Now that we have that lighter thing, we've uh, increased the speed to 75. We've decreased the power to 25. We're going to give this a second run. We probably should have done that as we were discussing cleaning yeah. optics. Sorry. Uh, next time, uh, we still are going to do one more run with the vector um, so we can uh, learn how to dial in the vector as well. Looks like uh, Mike on Facebook has a uh, Facebook. Fice. Facebook. I got a, a little Fice bit of an book. accent. Sorry about that. Mike on Facebook asks, I've been uh, looking for uh, at purchasing an FS laser uh, soon. Okay, Mike, if you're looking at purchasing a laser soon, please call us right now. We'll help you out with that right away. Uh, he's got a question, though, about training and uh, learning to use the machine. Is there uh, any training involved? Um, I'm a little apprehensive in buying uh, without any sort of training. Uh, what's available? Great question, Mike. Um, that almost feels like uh, it's set up for us, uh, but we have Laser 101, which is a great learning section. It has this material test uh, on it, which shows you how to dial in power settings for your machine. We have uh, how-to guides, uh, setup guides, quick startup guides, software guides, uh, alignment so guides. Many assets. So many assets, different videos, um, uh, design files. Walker puts out a new design file every single week, so you can learn how to design different things, like take his example and like build on yeah, it. Or the, I think the projects are not only like a project, but they're good learning tools. Absolutely. On why things are made that certain way. 
All right, Ruben, so let's take a look at what we got there. It looks like we got a nice, nice marking. What do you think, Ruben? Yeah, I definitely think so. I'm going to pass it on to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, that looks great. So if I was doing a photograph, I would definitely be looking for example two rather than example one. Here's why. The top one looks darker. It is darker. It absolutely is. But really, the only thing that I want dark is the middle because that's the only thing that's black. I want a nice gradient to go out to the edge. And for being honest, I would probably find something just in between here, maybe just a notch up. Maybe I would slow the laser head down 10 or 15% just to get a little bit more um, you know, difference in between the, the middle and the edge. But that gradient that goes uh, from the center to the edge is really nice on that lower, uh, lower example there. Ruben, would you mind sticking that back in the laser, sir? Appreciate you, man. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the vector lines. And this is the easiest one, it's really quick, and it's probably the most useful as you're doing cuts. So um, as we go over, we uh, just hid essentially the um, bitmap data, and now we're looking at the vector data. Um, as you can see, there is a yellow line, purple line, red line, blue line, uh, what have you. Now, uh, over to the right side, as you click on that object, you'll see all those colors off to the right. Now, what you can do is you can uh, type in different uh, quantities for those colors to see what cuts through. Now, um, it'll run in the order that you have listed there. So let's, in the red one, uh, make our best guess as to what's going to cut. I'm going to say 35 speed, 100 power will cut through that birch. What do you say? I think that's a good guess, yeah. So we'll guess 35. So the line above that is that green. Um, what do you say about that? Let's, um, have, let's do one that's just a little bit uh, slower, just in case. Let's do one that's at 30 speed. All right. And then with the, um, what's the one right below it? Um, Orange. So with that, um, the blue one, let's go to light blue right above the yellow. Let's down that one. Let's make that one th uh, 40 uh, speed and see if we could possibly cut through it going a little bit faster. Um, and we should have the black one um, turn it on as one pass because that'll cut out the square for us. All right. Uh, we'll try that one at 35 as well, I guess. This guy? And now, purple. purple, let's keep that at 100 speed uh, and try some vector marking. Now, I say we run the purple at 100, 100 just to see what happens. Okay, and then yellow. Then the yellow we can run at 100 speed at 10 power to see what kind of mark that puts on the material. I like 10 power as a good mark start because it's just a good way to see like kind of where you're at because it, it's either going to live below 10 in a delicate place or it's going to live somewhere marginally above 10. Mm -hmm. All right, so. We're just going to zoom in here on the software just a little bit. Yeah, did we take a picture? No. I don't think we did. Let's just move it into the middle of the board. No. Uh, Ruben, is there room right underneath where the laser head is? Is there anything right underneath it? Um, it's the material. Right, but is there anything marked on the material? Um, right under it. Like oh, no. Oh, perfect. Okay, okay. Yeah. so we'll just run it there. We'll just run a quick perimeter just to double check our location. That good? That's in a clean spot. And see, there you go. And we'll hit play. And this one will take almost no time as these lines are literally just an inch long. Yeah. So as you can see, it's running the black line first, which we probably should have drugged that to the end so it cut out the outside first. So there it ran the um, 100 speed, 100 power. That's fast. We're all mesmerized. Okay, there it is now. Uh, Ruben, if you wouldn't mind just uh, giving us those pieces uh, as what cut through. You might want to take the big piece out first, then uh, some of those little pieces might fall apart. Yeah. But try to take them out one piece at a time so we can kind of see what cut and what didn't cut. Okay, so as you see, that obviously that 35 cut pretty good. Uh, now, we'll start at the bottom and see what... Oh, you can get it all at once? All right, so that bottom definitely cut out. Second one cut out as well. So that was at 40 speed. You guys want it? Or yeah, yeah, please hand out. Yeah. yeah, then the big piece as well if you could, sir. We'll reassemble it. And so it looks like we could get away. Oh, look at that. It looks like we can get away with going a lot faster. And this is kind of the part about running this job I like, because you can now look at the edges. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, and kind of see which edge you want to end up with. Because um, really, you're looking for that beautiful uh, yeah. brown burn, right? Which yeah, looks right. like we got 
on this last one. So as you can see, everything up into that one cut through, uh, which is a good way to kind of assess like where your wood's at. Now, were we fine at 35 and 100? Absolutely. Is it nice though that we can cut at 40? Yeah, you know what I would do? I would test another one at 45 and see if I can get through and I bet mm -hmm. I couldn't and then I would find my dial in spot in between there. The reason why you wanna do that is you always wanna use the least amount of power possible to cut through your material to minimize three things. The effective kerf, the burn on wood, and then two, accuracy. Like um, if you're just blasting through it with a ton of power, you're making a huge channel, it's a ton of energy, it's a ton of heat. You mm -hmm. wanna get through that channel and cut through the channel with the, the most efficient use of heat and power as possible. Yeah, so your parts fit together mostly. All right, well, we're already hitting the 45 minute mark Ooh. here, so let's get uh, spinning. Uh, so we can kind of wrap this thing up. Uh, we do appreciate those calls in. Uh, we have a online survey that we would love for you to fill out. We actually have another little survey that we'll put right here. Uh, is this the side? Yeah, maybe it's right here. It's either here or here. Uh, but fill out that survey right now. Let us know what you'd like to see on next week's show. Uh, there's that one. Uh, in the Cut uh, this week, we'll be doing another episode live in the Cut. Uh, that's one of our favorite things to do. Walker will show you this week how to make people that look just like just like you uh so mm. if you want to um, oh, i don't know who wins mm. <laughs> we can take it <laughs> i yeah, think this yeah. wins though. it probably wins so if you want to learn how to make a personalized uh character whether it's for dungeon dragons or just for fun as a nice office gag uh, around the house by all means tune in friday walker's going to show you not only how to cut out and make the character but also how in the design file to take your face and make it so it comes out somewhat realistically yeah. just like the body so as we're, <laughs> as we're going through, um, we also have a uh, great announcement that we have another weekly contest winner. This one inspired by our um, ornaments uh, that we did near the um, uh, break of the year. Uh, this from Nick Marshall. Marshall. Uh, these are great ornaments. Um, the stack, and this is a great way where you can, like, you can take a two-dimensional cuts and put them together and make great three-dimensional objects. Um, he took the negative on the snowman, took the positive oh, yeah. on the snowflake. Just a great job, Nick. Those look really clean. Um, I'm sure everyone loved those that uh, used them uh, near the holidays and will love them next year as well. Uh, great job. Um, what else we have? Uh, we have a great special going on. Uh, last week we announced that you could get the Muse and the Cool Box for $5,000, but we, we wanted to do even more. So we threw on top of that a riser and rotary combo as well. So everything you see down below, Muse, riser, rotary, and the Cool Box, all for $5,000. That's a deal so hot you can't even handle it. Oh, that, is, that is a great deal. Um, there's also a deal if you're a Makerspace or EDU and you're trying to get multiple Muse, give our sales team a call. You can get five Muses, or excuse me, six Muses for the price of five. Give us a call on that one, we'll explain. We also have the Pro sales still going on. We have a few of those left in stock. The Pro 20 by 12. $4,500, we actually had a great um, uh, 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 customer uh, buy 20 by 12 on the sale. And actually check out the video right here, I'll put a link uh, up in the corner. It's a great unboxing video he made, uh, he just got it, he put it in his garage. He's already starting to make really cool stuff. So if you wanna check out a unboxing of an unbiased uh, customer who just bought the uh, 20 by 12 Pro, check out that video up here in the link and uh, we'll show that to you. Uh, we also have um, one more uh, little thing to announce. As we do uh, laser talk going forward, we'll do different, um, like this week we did Dungeons and Dragons, next week we'll have another topic. If you have a topic that you think lasers would fit perfect for, throw a suggestion out there. We would love to cover it and dive in as to how lasers could make that hobby, sport, game, um, Anything. Art, anything could it's make cooler. it better. If you think lasers make anything better or could make it better, give us an idea and we will exploit the H out of it. You know, we will <laughs> we'll do everything we can to make it as cool as possible with lasers. Yeah, that's my job. That's, I mean, it's really his, I mean, if you think about a great job, Walker gets to come to work every day and make yeah. awesome stuff with lasers. It, we, he should be paying us, I feel like, but, but <laughs> I don't know about that, that but I don't it know is a that. cool job. But remember, uh, we do have uh, the D&D &D, uh, one hour uh, build that we'll do on Friday. Um, it's the one uh, you saw this uh, made on In The Cut uh, yesterday. If there's something you'd like to see on In The Cut, uh, a specific material, specific application that you would just like to see the job ran from start to finish, no nonsense, no marketing ploy, just let's see that thing in the laser. I wanna see that ran from start to finish. 
let us know. We're, we're not scared. Actually, there's a survey right here where you give us a suggestion and say which one of those things you'd like to see. So just click that survey real quick. Let us know. That is if you're watching YouTube. We keep doing this. Yeah, and if you're watching live. live on Facebook right now, thank you for watching live on Facebook right now. But we also have this posted on YouTube thereafter. So if you wanted to see any of those things we mentioned, just check our YouTube page here in a few hours or first thing tomorrow and you'll see it up there. So until next time, we'll keep learning and making with uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And, uh, you know, otherwise, keep making. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> what Walker's line. Keep making. We'll see you next time, guys. I'm a little, I'm a little walker. I'm skinny and reading.